Oh, hello everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be hosting the next couple events uh, for us this morning. We have upcoming next, we have Eleanor Drinkwater and she is, this event is called Outrageous Women Entomologist Who Changed History. So I'm gonna go ahead and give a quick introduction to Eleanor and then let her take it away. So Eleanor is an entomologist fascinated by the personality and behavior of invertebrates. I can say I'm excited to learn about that today as well. She is a fellow with the Royal Geographic Society and the Scientific Exploration Society Explorer, and her research has led her to the jungles in Peru, Honduras, and most recently, French Guinea, where she has led a project to study the biggest beetle on the planet. Her inspiration, a source of it, comes from the amazing stories and women throughout history who have carved out a place for women in science. And today, we're gonna hear about fierce and surprising stories of three remarkable women who changed this face of entomology. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring in Eleanor. Welcome, Eleanor. And Hi. I will let you take it away from here. Brilliant. Well, I'm so excited to be here today. It's just such a brilliant opportunity to come and talk about. Oh, sorry, wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying it's, it's, it's so exciting to have the opportunity to talk about such an exciting topic of women in science. Um, so, so I've got a I've got a presentation uh, which I will I will share now. So hopefully you'll uh, be able to see this. Hang on one second. Uh, Great. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so there are just so many remarkable women out there whose stories, I believe, are just not told enough. And in fact, this was a real problem which I found uh, about writing this talk in that every time I found a new book about different women or, or came across a different web article, you know, there'd just be so many incredible women whose stories I really wanted to include today. But what I've decided to do is to kind of try and cover about 300 years of history and looking back over the past 300 years, picking out one woman from each 100 years in order to kind of really kind of tease out some of the kind of struggles that they faced and how they overcome them. And so I find women in history, historical women in science, just absolutely fascinating. But within those, I find women entomologists particularly fascinating. I mean, obviously I'm a bit biased, I'm an entomologist myself. Um, however, but despite that, I think that, you know, for many of these women at different points in history, it was already hugely taboo to go and become a scientist. And so you can just imagine how much more taboo it must have been to choose an area of science like entomology that's perhaps not seen as terribly ladylike, you know, which involves growing uh, maggots in, 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 in tubes or, or involves kind of crawling around in bushes to catch different types of invertebrates. So you can just imagine, you know, how shocking that must have been in kind of Victorian Britain or, or, or wherever else. Uh, so, so I think that these particular women are kind of are a particularly unusual group of remarkable women to kind of overcome so many layers of kind of taboo and social expectation in order to really do what they, they love doing, which was to study invertebrates. So I just think that these women are just so exciting and I'm so excited to share three of their stories with you today. So the first woman that we're gonna talk about is Maria Sibylia Merian, who is just absolutely one of my favorite figures in history of all time. So in order to kind of really appreciate how remarkable this wo woman was, I'm gonna take you back in history. So we are now back in history. We are back in 1647 in Frankfurt. So to provide a little bit of historical context, what, what else was going on at the time? So in the UK, we had um, King Charles I. He was currently in prison during the uh, Civil War in the UK. Whereas in America, they had, in Massachusetts, they put, brought in the first ever legislation in the Americas, um, making children go to school. And 
But on top of that, it was also a very exciting time for science. So we had the first ever detailed maps of the moon were published. And on top of that, around about this time, um, microscopes were beginning to become more available, which meant that there were some of the first ever descriptions of microbes, which is also kind of really exciting at uh, that time. However, despite some really kind of remarkable historical achievements during this time period, other areas of science, very important important areas, um, like entomology, were very much lagging behind. So around about this time, they, they believed in a, a concept called spontaneous generation, which is the idea that invertebrates and kind of things like flies or moths just kind of spontaneously appear out of nowhere. And I know that sounds crazy to us, but you can kind of understand where it might have come from. You know, if you leave some kind of meat outside, you know, you'll come back and it's covered in maggots. And so so around right about this time, you know, there was this kind of weird concepts uh, of these, you know, how invertebrates evolve and, and behave. However, even at this very, very early stage, not everyone would have believed uh, these ideas about entomology. And in fact, our Maria had a very unusual perspective of invertebrates, even at a very young age. We, we have stories about her at the age of kind of 12 or 13, um, collecting silk moths and keeping them and, and watching them and kind of recording their, their development. She was also an artist and so would sp spend hours kind of drawing the different stages of um, the life cycle. So, so, so remarkably, um, while a lot of uh, a lot of people would have believed the theory of spontaneous generation. You have uh, this woman who, at the age of 13, probably had a much greater understanding of invertebrate life cycles than most people at the time. So she continued her passion for entomology into her married life. She was married to a man called Johann Andreas Graf. Um, and stories suggest that her house was completely full with different invertebrates. I mean, it might have been, she might have been keeping them a bit like this uh, insectarium uh, shown on the left here. Uh, however, I, I reckon that her house may have been perhaps a little bit more like my house looks at times, um, completely full of kind of jars and bottles of, of invertebrates at different stages of development. Uh, she was also unusual in that that uh, she wasn't interested in keeping specimens, she was just interested in kind of growing them and, and observing her life, their life cycle. However, unfortunately, um, her marriage was not a happy one. And many women at that time would find themselves kind of trapped in that environment. However, she was a very unusual woman in, in that, you know, she wasn't happy where she was. So what she did was she fled to Friesland, where she joined a religious sect who actually helped her to get a divorce from her husband, uh, which was pretty remarkable at the time. Also, while she was uh, staying with these people and managing to get a, a divorce, she also managed to uh, to carry out a whole range of fascinating studies of metamorphosis in, in frogs. Um, but she didn't stop there. After after she'd managed to to separate from her husband, she then went to Amsterdam, where she set up a art shop with her daughters, in which they would provide art materials and also were commissioned to do pieces of art. And you know, just taking a, a step back here, like I, I feel like even today it's a really remarkable thing for people to set up their own business. But but just take a moment to to kind of appreciate how remarkable this was for a woman in the 1600s to set up her her own business um so yeah again really really remarkable but it was around about this time that she began hearing about invertebrates overseas so uh at this time they were kind of bringing back uh, lots of different specimens or the trading vessels would bring back different specimens or, or some of which she managed to to get to see and she kind of kept got this fascination, you know, she was already fascinated by the invertebrates that you get in the in Europe, but suddenly she was seeing these kind of giant moths and giant butterflies that you know, I can imagine just, just made her kind of so excited to try and see them in person. And remarkably, and tenaciously, she managed to get funding and she managed to, to, to put together enough money in order to get a, a passage to get to Suriname to study invertebrates in the wild herself. Um, so so just, just to kind of give you some context, so this is probably the type of vegetation that she would have been, been working in. And 
just such a different environment from uh, Europe in in the 1600s. She probably had never left um, a lot of uh, Europe. You know, very 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 unusual for for a woman to kind of get abroad like this, uh, particularly without a, a, a chaperone. And there are just some kind of amazing stories of her kind of climbing trees in her petticoats and kind of wielding machete to try and collect as many bugs as she possibly could. And, and what she would do is she would collect caterpillars and then she would bring them back to her, her hut and then she would rear them over the, the course of several months in order to kind of really understand uh, their their life history and how they, how they grew. Um, and so, so just to give you a little bit more context about, like, this is a really nice image of, of how the rainforests over there are some of the time, you know, this looks very kind of inviting. Um, but I'll just show you a little clip. I've, I've never been lucky enough to, to work in Suriname myself, but I worked in uh, French Ghana recently, uh, which has a similar kind of rainforest type. And so I've just got a little clip that I'm gonna show you, which hopefully will kind of highlight uh, what the conditions are like most of the time. So, so actually, yeah, you can see here. <laughs> I mean, you know, there is a, a reason it's 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 called a rainforest after all. And most of the time, you're kind of under canvas. You're wet. You're you're muddy, and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but we were doing that kind of with with full on kind of Gore-Tex and and rain rain gear and uh, and walking boots. I just can't imagine doing the same thing. Um, in petticoats. I, uh, that still kind of really, really blows my mind. And what's more, she not only managed to get out there, but she managed to produce this piece of work, uh, which is still today kind of thought of as one of the most beautiful pieces of entomological art ever produced. But not only was it a beautiful piece of artwork in itself, but also it really kind of made people think slightly differently about entomology. Up to this point, when you would have a, a book about entomology, you would have the different specimens kind of side by side or kind of separate because that's what would happen. The invertebrates would be sent back and then they'd be they'd painted, you know, in their kind of dead form. What she was very unusual, how she was very unusual, was the fact that she was able to get out there and study them in the wild. Um, and as you can see some of her drawings here, you have the, the adult form, you have the larvae, you have the, 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 the food that they're eating, you have predators that might kind of attack them, you know, this little wasp here, which might be a parasitoid wasp. And this kind of holistic view of invertebrates within their environment is something that we're very confident about today. We call it ecology, the study of ecology. Um, but at the time, this was a really unusual way of thinking about uh, entomology. And uh, here's two, uh, you know, a few more slides of just showing the fact that it's not the invertebrates alone which are important, but understanding the link between the invertebrates and other invertebrates within their, their kind of ecosystem, which is important. And it's likely that some of her thoughts may have really coloured the thinking of some of the other really important uh, scientists that we had. So this is now moving forward about 100 years. And actually, it was found, uh, Darwin was found to have a copy of uh, some of her artwork um, after he, he died. So, so, you know, it might have been the case that some of her ideas might have coloured some of his. So now this, this kind of nicely segues to the next woman that I'm going to introduce, the next story that I'm going to, to tell you. So, so living uh, at the same time as Darwin was this remarkable woman called Mary Ann Teresa Whitby. Now, unfortunately, the, I haven't been able to find any images of her, but this image is called uh, Woman in Silk, which I thought was very apt for, for, for this particular character. So she was a uh, a very different uh, character to, to, to the last woman that we spoke about. Uh, she was uh, widowed at in her early 20s, so I think she was about 22 when she was widowed, and she was known to be kind of lively and intelligent, and she had so many different hobbies. She was fascinated by geology, she was fascinated by antiques, she was fascinated by literature, so a kind of like, you know, real fascination with so many different areas of kind of science and, and history. And in 1835, things kind of changed for her a little bit because she found out about silkworms. She was traveling at the time and she 
begin chatting with a gentleman who spoke to her a lot about uh, silkworms and how much money could be made from, from silkworms. And she thought this would be a really great opportunity for uh, particularly to improve chances for female employment, to provide um, opportunities like um, spinning silk. And so she kind of set out to try and establish this for the first time in the UK. So she actually had a bunch of these caterpillars shipped from Europe to the UK and she set them up in her stable and as well as importing all, all the food. However, this wasn't without its challenges. She was told repeatedly that women are not likely to succeed in it because apparently it was spinning silk was something that was just far too difficult for women to do and in fact it's it took she turned out to be brilliant at rearing the caterpillars but this kind of really difficult skill of of um taking their cocoons and spinning it out into uh silk threads just was just something that they, they didn't manage to crack and she was kind of at this for about 10 years and you can imagine how frustrating this must have been for her as a kind of a very, very bright, talented woman and having this constant criticism saying that, well, of course she wouldn't get the succeeds because women couldn't possibly do that. However, she did succeed. And not only did she succeed, but she managed to produce silk of such high quality that she was able to present it to the queen and not only was she able to present her silk to the queen, but she was also able to speak about her results at a meeting of the Royal Agricultural Society of England, which I think the two of these uh, kind of statements that she, she managed to achieve just is, is an amazing kind of like um, response to all of the criticism that she had over these these 10 years. So like, again, uh, a really kind of determined, remarkable woman. And I just, it must have been amazing for her when she managed to achieve this. And also, uh, this kind of links us back to, to Darwin, because not only was she uh, a remarkable woman in terms of her entrepreneurial skills in managing to raise these caterpillars, but she also was really useful to, to Darwin and his theories and his development of his theory of natural selection. So Darwin had a real problem with caterpillars in that um, most of his theory of natural selection at the time was kind of linked together colours to sexual selection. So you have different coloured butterflies that are kind of bright and beautiful and then they're more selected by mates and in turn it becomes more and more bright and beautiful. However, caterpillars pose a, a real problem for this um, at the time because you know caterpillars they're not then they don't mate and so how could the colors be selected for and so he uh, collaborated with her and, and asked her to, to perform various experiments breeding caterpillars to look for um, changes over time to see whether or not markings were hereditary and uh, this is what he had to to say about them. You know, she, he cannot express too strongly his thanks for the extraordinary trouble. Oops, um, for the extraordinary trouble which he had taken. And you know, this just really goes to show how, you know, often I feel, particularly around this time, you don't necessarily hear about the contributions that these women have made to science, but they were kind of directly, kind of really helping. Um, characters uh, like Darwin informing these really important uh, theories. Okay, so now we're going to kind of uh, segue to the last woman that I'm going to speak about. And again, a remarkable woman in, in a very different way. So one of the th theories, which again, or one of the groups, which again caused a lot of problems for Darwin was social invertebrates. And it was his kind of problem, essentially, with social invertebrates, you have one or two individuals in a colony that breeds and a whole range of other individuals who are completely sterile. And again, this is very difficult for Darwin to kind of integrate with his ideas of, of, of sexual selection. However, fortunately for us, there have been many remarkable academics who've taken up this challenge to try and understand why you get these kind of weird um, systems of, of social organization. And one of these remarkable scientists, otherwise known as the termite queen, was Dr. Margaret James Strickland Collins. So 
she, her story starts in 1922 Virginia and so she grew up she had kind of very humble beginnings um, but from a very early age she was kind of identified as a bit of a, a child prodigy she was kind of going into the libraries and picking up books from a kind of really really early age and perhaps unsurprisingly based on that she then got a scholarship to West Virginia State University where she studied biology and she was doing really well and she at this time she wasn't quite sure what she wanted to do uh, but she thought maybe she'd collect kind of specimens so at the time you could go and collect you know specimens of invertebrates and bring them back and get kind of paid to do that however so so in order to do this she started uh taking on work or, or started taking on some courses some extra courses at chicago university um which is where she attracted the attention of Alfred E. Emerson, who at the time was the leading world expert on termites. And eventually he, she managed to impress him so much that he agreed to enroll her as one of his PhD students. And this was really brilliant at the time because she became the first ever African-American woman to um, do a PhD in entomology. And so it was brilliant that uh, he, he, she was able to have this opportunity. However, despite this, there were still kind of struggles that she faced along the way. So for example, she was informed that uh, he, she could be his PhD student, but she wasn't allowed to go to the field because apparently women are too annoying to go to the field. Um, so, so kind of like a, a really interesting uh, a relationship with, with this uh, uh, supervisor. And, I couldn't uh, pass this off without kind of uh, just highlighting what a cool study system she was working on and and the fact that she kind of contributed so much to what we know about termites. A lot of her her, her papers are still kind of cited today. Um, uh, just 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 super quickly, the they have this amazing uh, social system in which you'll have a queen and a king which will reproduce and they will produce eggs that can then differentiate into so many different kind of phenotypes. You get like soldiers, you get workers, you get some that can reproduce. Um, and fascinatingly, there's also some suggestion that that queens can decide to clone themselves and so they, they produce asexually so you kind of get the same clone of the queen kind of for years and years so a really fascinating system that she really contributed a lot to our understanding of um so so she did really well at, at howard university during and after her phd however she eventually became super frustrated about the fact that she noticed that there just wasn't opportunities there was the progression for women in this particular university was just so slow and she became very frustrated with this. So she moved to Florida A&M University, which uh, potentially would be kind of better in that it would pr promote women in a way that um, Howard University wouldn't at that time. And then at this time was kind of heralded a kind of a, a real kind of shift in, in her, her work. So. So at, while she was at this university, it was in May 26, uh, 1956. And I'm sure many of you know the story already, but at this time, two students, uh, Wilhelmina Jakes and Carrie Patterson, who were at Florida A&M University, they decided to, to sit down in, in the white area of the segregated uh, buses. And well, tragically, the, first of all, somebody complained and then the bus driver came over and that they offered to get off so long as they got their money back. But instead, the bus driver drew the, drove them to the police station where they were arrested. Um, this then sparked this kind of social uprising at the time in which um, students kind of then would um, boycott these, these, these racist segregated buses. Um, and and um, so our brilliant entomologist, uh, she kind of stepped in at this point and offered to drive the students so they wouldn't have to take these buses and became very, very involved in trying to use her platform as an academic to to kind of really argue for, for, for better equality in the sciences. And so this is kind of where, where, where it started. But eventually in 1978, she was able to, to lead uh, the American 
Association for the Advancement of Science in a symposium entitled Science and the Question of Human Equality. Um, so this really high level symposium and kind of others that she was really involved with are kind of credited in, in changing so many people's views about racial equality in the sciences. And this was a really brave thing for her to do at the time. Um, she was constantly threatened by death threats um, and kind of other threats of violence. But despite that, she would continue to kind of speak out uh, for racial equality, um, which, you know, just such a brave woman. And uh, I, I'm sure you'll be very glad. I, I just wanted to, to kind of end her story in that she continued doing uh, field work right up until her, her death. And in fact, uh, she passed away peacefully in, in 1996, uh, doing what she loved, uh, studying invertebrates. Um, and again, kind of proving that women should be in the field. So these are three monumentally brilliant women and I, I believe that each one of them kind of had their different struggles but kind of showed incredible kind of stamina and determination in in the different ways and you know for me I find these women kind of you know a real inspiration and they would be so proud of how far we've come since since then and uh there's conditions in, in science now for women working in science is just so much better than anything they experienced however However far we've come though, there is still more work to be done. So the situation today, still women only make up 29.3% of people employed in research and development. There is still a huge gender pay gap. So this is just uh, the pay gap in the UK, but there's been similar statistics come out in other countries as well. And on top of that, and perhaps most shockingly, in my opinion, a behavioural ecology journal recently um, double blinded its review process and they found that after double blinding it there was a 7.9% increase in papers that were accepted uh, from which were first authored by by women which unfortunately suggests that there's still a lot of kind of stigma uh, attached to to women in science which again is just very frustrating <laughs> I don't think it's all doom and gloom. Uh, research today is showing that the gender gap in the sciences is beginning to close and particularly within the field of biology, it is kind of moving towards gender equality in the number of uh, women who are employed in, in science. Uh, but kind of more, even more exciting for me, I believe, is the way in which particularly um, the undergraduates that I teach and even the kind of younger scientists and that teenagers and, and, and younger uh, kids kind of really engage with these issues of kind of equality and diversity in science and you know kind of seeing the kind of energy and enthusiasm to kind of move to a better direction for this I just find like just so exciting and it kind of really gives me hope that despite the fact that you know we have come a long way and there's still there's still a way to go but I feel like with the kind of enthusiasm that you see among uh, young people I, I feel very hopeful that that we will get there. So that's all I have to say uh, about these kind of remarkable women and you know as I said these are just uh, three brilliant women um, out of many who could have been been chosen both kind of contemporary and historical and I hope that uh, you know I think that they've got different things to kind of teach us but I think overall um, things that kind of really came came through to me were the kind of determination of these women and how we can be determined how we should continue to be curious and most importantly how we can all study bugs so so thank you very much and i'll stop sharing my my screen now eleanor that was fantastic thank you <laughs> so much thank um, you. we have a couple of questions for you that have come through um so we can take just a minute or two to answer some of those the first one is what is your favorite insect or group of insects? Oh gosh, now now this is a very hard question. This is such a hard question. Um, so so my PhD that, that I've, I've been doing is actually on wood lice. And uh, so in America, I think you call them roly polies. Is that what you call them? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they are just the most amazing creatures you'll ever come across. First of all, they, they carry their babies in a little pouch. So basically they're like tiny kangaroos. Um, they can survive conditions that some, that like heavy metal conditions, they can survive concentrations of heavy metals that's higher than any other known animal. So they're really badass. And and also they like to snuggle, which is great as well. So so yeah, they're just great in many loves. And they have great personalities. So what's what's not to love? Amazing. I know they're one of a favorite for many people here to go and find outside in the backyard as well. Um, also, what of these three women, you left us with a great message of the three of them and what we can do. How can we find out more about women entomologists? Are there books that we can go and find out? Are they not really that well studied? What's, what's your advice for that? Well, I, I, so, so for me, a, a really great uh, resource is the the Natural History Museum of London actually did this really great uh, project called Darwin's Forgotten Women, I think that's what it's called, in which they go back and they, they trace all of the amazing women who he used knowledge he used to come up with his theory and there are so many of them and so 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 for me that was a real kind of eye-opener and, and why I really wanted to, to include the second woman in, in this talk just because she kind of encapsulates one of of so many women who kind of fed into his theory so that's a, a really lovely a lovely place to start um but but also um there's a lovely there, there's some brilliant things written so dr collins in particular has been really kind of embraced uh, by the entomology community she's very very popular and so there's a lot of academic articles that have been written about her and about her life so so yeah natural history museum for the historical stuff and then the academic literature for 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 more contemporary stuff about dr collins Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Eleanor. It's been fantastic to have you here today. And I believe you're coming back to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for um, in a few weeks, maybe next week, um, for another talk. So we can all stay tuned and um, listen up for that one as well. Brilliant. So well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Like, it's so great to come and chat to you guys. So thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. We'll see you a little later. Bye. Bye.